I continued my formal and informal music studies when I was in college. I took an independent degree at a school that didn't offer a music degree, luckily. Um, uh, Washington Lee University uh, in 1970, I got there. Um, I had skipped a year of high school, but I couldn't stand it any longer. Um, and uh, I ran into an old-time banjo player, a geology professor who was sort of mighty to learn how to play the old-time banjo with absolutely zero string instrument experience of any kind. And by dint of will and with no, what anybody would call raw talent, uh, Odell McGuire turned himself into a perfectly fine old-time banjo player. And Odell carried me around to meet all the old-time people that he, that he was learning from. And his strategy, and it has become mine, when I want to learn something new, is go find the oldest person who still does it, who's been doing it for a long time, you know, a tradition bearer, and go and sit with them. And not once make David go home, go and sit, have a relationship, build a thing. And Odell gave me this by ushering me into all these places where I would never have thought I would be welcome. And I'll just, uh, just thought, you know, if he says yes, we're going. <coughs> Can't hurt to ask. So I had this really wide musical life. During the week, I was writing atonal chamber music, listening to Baby Babbitt and um, Schoenberg. And uh, on the weekends, I was learning to play old time fiddle and banjo from illiterate 78 and 90 year olds in West Virginia. North Carolina. So it's been a very wide and interesting life. But all I do is begin to learn. Thankfully, there's no end. Pablo Casals at 95. He had a music reviewer, an old friend, come into town. Pablo had quit playing out, you know, when he was in his mid 80s. <laughs> but arguably the finest cellist of the 20th century. In 1971, when he was 95, this guy was coming into town. He said, Pablo, can I come out and see you? Yeah, but don't come until 1230. Take a break for lunch. He said, Take a break? What are you doing? He says, I play three hours in the morning and I play three hours in the afternoon. 95. So the guy gets there for lunch break, and they say hello and sit down and have a cup of tea and start to eat. And, and the reporter says, it's Pablo, are you going to gig out? I said, no. So six hours a day? He says, yeah. Five days. Not seven. <laughs> I take the weekends off. He said, why are you still playing so much? And Pablo said, I'm starting to see some improvement. <laughs> I want to frame what it is we do because the modern world has a very warped idea of what we do, how we do it, and why. And I want to take these in order. I'm going to talk a little bit longer rather than play, but I'm going to keep my guitar up for protection and security. <laughs> um, first, In 2000, I was selected as a public fellow at UNC in Chapel Hill and got paired up with a professor to work on a, a proposal which was to develop coursework and a, and, a, and, a, and a paper on teaching as a performance art. And I was going to do the brain science and, uh, and the performer part of it. And Dr. Wally Hamm at the you know, School of Ed, graduate school, was going to do the pedagogy of why we have an educational system in this country that's still based around the 18th century model of preparing people to stand on a production line for eight or 10 hours without complaining. Um, you know, just subjected to as much boredom and repetitive things as they possibly could, dead in the brain and then control. And, and we were about four months into that when Wally got a call from the World Health Organization. They were training nurses in Africa, lay nurses, to go out and try and stop the AIDS epidemic. And they go out in the bush and fail. I said, Wally, we need, we're not teaching them right. We need to, you know, we need your help here. And Wally called me and he said, Scott, I'm going to have to stop our work together for a while. Um, he told me what the problem was. He said, you know, if I, if I teach badly here, some grad student will get a C. If I teach badly there, people will die. I said, Wally, go. Let me know what happens. <coughs> so four months later, Wally's back in the country for a little while. And he called me. I said, great, coffee. He said, Scott, I'm using all the ideas we developed, and it's working like gangbusters across cultural lines, across the most beautiful thing. I mean, there, there are different kinds of authority, right? And leadership. 
Uh, we can't flunk the audience or send them to the vice principal's office. So we have to engage them and then get them to go where we want them to go. And this has been going on since uh, we were gathered around the Neanderthal campfires. The Grio or Shaman is there. And he is telling us our history. He's reminding us of who we are, where we've been, and what we've been through. And there are implicit or explicit questions about, are we still these people? Is this us? This is who we were. Are we still who we thought we were? Who we want to be? We're basically leaders without authority. One leadership model is you control others. The other leadership model is we control ourselves. And the stage becomes the place where we are melted down and we confuse. It is a fearful place. It is a place where we refine ourselves. Pema Chodra, a Tibetan nun, said that it is only by being sandblasted every day that that which is irreducible will be revealed. And this is the place where I get sandblasted a lot. <laughs> and, and you do too. So the artist role in society I see, uh, I don't buy the ego thing, I don't buy the lust for applause, and I don't buy the running after the money. I don't think anybody in this room picked up an instrument or started singing, thinking, I'm going to make a lot of money at this. <laughs> I'll be surprised if you did, and you'll be surprised. <laughs> But I think what we do is we hold a mirror up to our culture, we reflect back for them some portion of who we are. And then by doing that, we raise the question, are we happy with this? It makes music not so much an entertainment, it has to be entertaining, as a tool to shape a community. And I think that's the work we do. I think we're taking a bunch of strangers and turning them into a group. And we do it with something as simple as sound in the air. So I'm going to argue that what we're doing is less self-expression, or if it is self-expression, it's self-expression for community expression. That we are servants of the community when we take this place. And in the same way the shaman was loved and feared, we can be loved and feared. <laughs> but the arts aren't a luxury. There is survival mechanism. They cement the bonds between people, which makes the survival of a hunter-gatherer group more likely. Individualism is, a, is the lecture. If we look back at the Paleolithic art, the cave art in Mexico, <coughs> France, in Altamira, Spain, 11, 12,000 years old, they discovered a cave in 1992 in the wine country in France, Chauvet Cave, that pushed the dawn of art back 40,000 years to 50,000 years ago. There are 40,000 year old fragments of bone flutes that have been found in caves in Iceland and in Slovenia. Music and art are not negotiable. You don't take them out of us and still wind up with human beings at the end. It's one of the building blocks that allows our species to survive and to try and dismiss it as, as a bobble on the wrist of some rich person is crazy. We need these things. They help us survive which is why every one of you picked up an instrument. You picked it up to cement your survival. For me, music is my religion. I worship at the altar of the sounds that we make. Those sounds unite us in joy or grief. They shape us and guide us forward and remind us of our history. And all of those things are critical to me knowing who I am now and aiming me toward who I like to be. What I say about religion is, as a repository for the great questions that attend human life in this plane, religions can be a force, a great force for good. But they're a force for evil the moment they think they've answered any of them. A religion lives in its questions, and it dies in its answers. And it will also allow someone to kill their neighbor. Surety is a lethal force in human communities, being sure you're right. Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. 
the son of the senator, went into the Civil War three times from Massachusetts. He was wounded twice and sent home, recovered, and went back into that bloody country. And he came out of the war with this idea that it is surety, being sure that you're right, that is the root of all violence. Yes. And as a Supreme Court Justice later, he entertained the questions deeply, but even when he had to make a judgment, he did not claim that his judgment was necessarily right, but that it appeared to be this, and he made his rulings. But he held them very tenderly and couched them carefully because he had enough of violence. So I like songs that raise questions better than songs that purport to provide answers. 